Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. We have an affirmative knock that is actually working. Um, so welcome to Leadership Conversations with Jim McNeish, part Hello. two. Um, <laughs> so we got so many messages from yes people yesterday and I'm so sorry, we have no idea what happened. I was saying to Jim, we yesterday was a bad tech day. Even our electronic bin started opening and closing in a random manner. So welcome to the crazy world of Mercury Retrograde. So we're we're live and we're working now. We have the affirmative note from Billy who's hanging outside with the aerial just to make sure it's in the park <laughs> okay. um, So we had a great chat yesterday. And since it was the warm up, I am very much looking forward to the chat that we have today. Um, and I'm going to introduce Jim McNeish. And the thing is, is because we've been doing the podcast together, I love this because I get to ask all the questions at this point. Um, and I'm going to tell you about my experience with Jim McNeish. And I, he, he entered into my consciousness years and years ago. Lots of people were nudging me and saying, you need to speak to Jim McNeish. Um, and clearly I didn't do it at the right time and, and get, get in amongst it. But I remember the brilliant Kat Kennedy and myself turned up at Cancel, which was Jim's leadership centre up in the Highlands. And you know when you're, you're in a place and you didn't know how tense you were and your shoulders drop for a fortnight? That's what happened when you walk through Cancel. And it happened every single time since then. And what I came to realise was, yes, it was in the Highlands. Yes, it was the design of the place because Jim's eye for design is as acute as his eye and his love and his passion for leadership in humans. And he just created a, an incredible space. He created a, a wonderful opportunity for people to have conversations that really matter. Um, Jim is a storyteller. I adore his stories. It is ridiculous. I've been to so many of his trainings. And I know I've heard a couple of the stories and I'm one of those people that go, oh, listen to this one. You'll love it. You'll love it. Um, and even if I have heard it before, the humility by which he puts it across just brings it alive in a different sense. Um, I've been lucky enough, as you know, we've been um, doing the podcast together for the last 753 weeks of lockdown. And uh, here we are now, I get to ask the question. It's weird to think about what the questions would be. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Jim McNeish. Hey, good morning. Nice to be here. What an intro. There's a red carpet. <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I follow you everywhere you go and introduce you. In such yeah, a do that. It is deserved. Uh, it is deserved. So, <laughs> thank so, you. so since I get to ask the questions this time, um, it feels so powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. Give me your top three words of today. How are you feeling today? Anticipatory. Oh, good one. Um, receptive. And poised. Agitation oh, free. Nice. Ladies and gentlemen, I Ooh, give you. I like that. Right, tell me again. Mm. Tell me again. So anticipatory. Anticipatory. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, receptive. And poised. Discuss. So I was recording a little video yesterday for the Shadow of a Leader program that starts next month. And um, I did um, 300 takes. <laughs> and um, <laughs> by, the, by the 259th, when you're still trying to look chipper and upbeat and, and really wandering through the woods and the rain starts to come on, <laughs> you, you're not agitation free. And, and then I got a really great take as I went through it and just looked. I was like, what is that? And it was a bit of spit on my lip. Um, and so I was not agitation free. Um, there was a few trees nearly got punished in my woods. Um, but um, today it's like that's done and we're, we're sorted. We know what we're doing today and we're launching a whole bunch of stuff, our new podcasts and the new program and all those things. So. Yeah, I feel good. I feel like I'm ready for the day. I love that. I just think it's just like, here's my shadow. We're talking about shadow. We're gonna, we're gonna... <laughs> just, yeah, I was... Give you an example. Yeah, I was a bad man yesterday. A bad, bad man. It's just as well I only had my own company. But um, yeah. <laughs> I hear you. I was good. the same talking to the bin. It was opening and closing. I was like, <laughs> I am talking to a bin. This is not a good sign. Um, 
so we've had lots of conversations. The premise of the podcast has been about what are the new conversations? What is leadership? Where does it take us? Um, what are you most excited about going forward? To see if something really has got born in people during this time. Like, have we shifted? Mm. I think, um, you know, our, have people confronted a bit of their own shadow? Have they integrated a little bit more of them? Um, and uh, are, are we are we moving forward? Do we know how to connect with each other uh, in a kinder and more intelligent way? And will that result in something that is a a better world to live in. So I, I'm interested to see, will anything remain? And I'm hopeful, um, and I'm gonna do my best to make it remain in me. Yeah, I was having a few conversations like that yesterday, just, I, I am hopeful, even if, you know, there's there's queues outside the shops and things just now in, in England. And, you know, I'm like, oh, it just felt like, boom, we were straight back and I understand we have to get the economy back and, um, yeah, there's, there's a, I'm excited and concerned about that at the same time, I think. There's there's the, a real sort of tension. Um, and what's your concern? What is your concern? I'm concerned for um, some of the dualism, some of the either-ors that are going on, some of the new lines that are being drawn. Mm. Like what? Um... um Black Lives Matter would be one, you know, where um, there's a bunch of people who could end up being wrong and a bunch of people who could end up being right on both sides. Yes. You know, people start to, they've made me feel too guilty. I've been too provoked. And therefore, you know, uh, I make people more wrong or more covertly wrong, you mm -hmm. know. And so some of those those prejudices go even more deeply into our system into our fabric you know the line of good and evil is drawn through every heart it's not drawn between people and how do we get to that space of, of noticing in ourselves those things rather than it being further projection of clearer factions and clearer mm -hmm. groups and um, so and <clears throat> same with environmentalists uh, issues you know like uh, same thing again it's like will the lines just be clearer drawn between people or will actually that severing have happened in each of us at an individual level where we've looked inside at what's going on? Um, that would be my concern, that that stuff doesn't improve and in fact becomes more uh, fractious. There's, a, there's an opportunity for it, isn't there? There is a... There is a, the great unlearn, as Rachel uh, Cargo would say, is we have to unlearn a lot um, and he certainly as a white person I need to unlearn a lot um, and it's being comfortable with the uncomfortableness of that because you know the dualism is you know can be about race but it's it's deeper than that you know there's things that that I don't know is racism that exists and and it is about it's an education we have to educate ourselves mm -hmm. we have to um, in terms of there's there's always uh, I see John's here he's happy the tech is working um, and we've got we've got people here who are um, looking you know they're from an an L and D perspective an L and D background you know what's the the opportunity of learning and development in this space you know there's a big shift we've had many conversations about this given your experience your knowledge and and what you bring out to the world what what's the what's the opportunity. I think there's an opportunity for L and D to take its place at the point of the arrowhead. You know, to go there and bring us back things from the, um, you know, just from the edges in terms of AI and technology and, and learning. Like, um, I've got a friend in um, England who has a, a an IT system which basically listens and pours through language. And so it can detect language that is missing in a conversation, tones and archetypes and, um, uh, you know, uh, emotive terms that, that perhaps would augment a conversation better. 
you know, what could we be using there, you know, to accentuate the coaching experience? Mm. Uh, we're sat there and, and we're listening to one another. And given that so much now of an interaction is word based, we've got far less micro cues, far less of that pheromones going on between people, far less of that normal organic human interaction. And so we're increasingly, our, our communication is contingent on the actual words. Well, there's AI that can actually detect the quality tone and, and content of those words that could be given as real-time feedback that would augment relationships and the communication. One example, but um, I think learning and development, if we're not careful, can become just a broker service for the organization. And then people like you and I get to go in and do the sexy work. Um, I just think there's an opportunity for the, those L&D people to just put themselves right at the arrow point of research and what is out there. And because I do think that we've entered into a whole new horizon and a whole new bunch of work they can bring back. And exciting, right? And I think that the, I, I think maybe the dualism of AI and humanity has been has been eroded somewhat with COVID-19 because there was a big fear about AI. I think it's still in existence, mm. right? I think the reliance that we've had on technology to get us through this experience and, you know, there's, there's we're very privileged that we have this because not everyone does in the world. Um, it sounded fair. Scott, it always sounds super Scottish when you say world, isn't it? It's like <laughs> world. World. Um, <laughs> Worm's another one and a girl. And they've all Girl. got two syllables. They've all got two syllables. <laughs> so Girl and so when you hear it and you go, oh, that's it there. <laughs> um, that, it seems that that dualism has been broken down a little, which is exciting. And I think we can, one of those things, one of the threads that we can pull through is actually that it can aid us and it can allow us to be more human. Mm, absolutely. I think... You know, people who are at the kind of cutting edge of AI have said there is really nothing to worry about now. And of course, that's all part of the plot. If only there'd been a sign, you know. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it, <clears throat> the capacity is, is is not there for world domination yet. Um, there's a great capacity for good and augmentation and openness. Um, I, I think also maybe that's one of the key human attributes that we need to be developing, which is less fear of vulnerability and openness mm. you know just because you're vulnerable and open doesn't mean you have to give away your deepest darkest shame you still get to work on that stuff privately but actually you can you know come down a few layers come down a few layers just learn put a toe in the water and learn how to be present with your genuine actual experience and how to articulate and talk about it and i think if we as particularly learning and development people are um searching out that landscape in themselves and they're pushing there and they're finding safe and appropriate ways of people doing that i think bringing that back from the horizon bringing that back from the the pioneering front mm. is a i think there's a massive agenda for learning and development now and and it is a you know weirdly the the simplicity of the agenda is in humanity it's in about allowing people to be more whole, allowing people to have the brilliant conversations. Chris Hallam's here. I hope you're feeling a lot better, Chris, because he's he's had a wee operation. Um, so he's talking about, um, he was saying about loving that element of conversation. And and it is, I, I, you know, people have had their, you know, they've had 15 minutes of break being broken in. Let's go in, let's go shadow. <laughs> um, because Joss, and thanks for it, you managed to get in, Joss, that's awesome. Um, Joss is asking, because of, and I want to talk more about the course, I'm super excited about the course because <laughs> I, I've had some sneak conversations and um, it's given me a a thrill actually for what conversations could happen on the back of it. And Joss was asking, can you tell us more about the shadow part of ourselves and the opportunity it offers? Sure. So the shadow is the disowned parts of ourselves. In the process of creating an idealized ego image, which is the admirable and um, charismatic, laudable part of ourselves that people follow, we automatically sort out those things that don't belong to it and they get pushed down and repressed. And uh, in that kind of neglected state, they start to rot and become stinky and they haunt us at two in the morning, they nag us because they still have energy. It's just that they're showing up negatively in our lives. 
Um, Marie Louise von France says, um, "You must treat the shadow as you would any other person. Uh, sometimes you have to resist it. Sometimes you engage it. Sometimes you integrate it. Sometimes you love it. The shadow." is there as a whole part of you, it only becomes hostile when you neglect or ignore it. Mm. And so this pushing it down creates a hostility in ourselves. And so um, the work of the shadow is to reintegrate those bits of ourselves again, is to bring them back into the light, is to have a look at them, is to create a kind of redemptive story for each one so that we can start to bring them back in as supports to our life. Um, and the, the upside of the shadow is, is that those parts were meant to be part of your character structure. They're vital and important parts of your character structure. Sometimes they're very um, unattractive in terms of they're, they're just mundane, but they provide a phenomenal balance to maybe a, a really charismatic other side, or they provide an access to emotions that, that allow you to be more vigilant or more aware in the world that, that appear negative on the surface, but actually they're there to just create a, a, a real balance in your life so that you're much more whole and much more complete. Um, and so the, the work of integrating that shadow is the important developmental work for a leader. And I, I loved your video about shadow. It's only had a gazillion views. Um, so <laughs> yeah. for those of you that are watching this, no one who's watching this and seen you, I'm going to guess that you've seen it. Um, but uh, I love that notion of the most profound thing that you can do is engage with, with your shadow as a leader. And I love what Vanessa is saying is um, that her coaching conversations are getting much deeper, much more quickly in terms yeah. of having the real conversation. Um, and actually, um, while wow, Black Lives Matter and COVID-19 has stripped a few layers off of denial and it feels a bit easier yes. to get into the stuff that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was the genius of the Black Lives Matter work, which is if you see any of the campaigners or any of the people who are kind of asserting this on media, there is an unreasonableness about them. They're saying, don't come to us for the answers anymore. Don't come to us to do the work for you. You do the work. And we know that these folks are intelligent enough to know that there isn't a system where we've got a switch we can switch off and suddenly it all starts to work but they're just not letting folks off the hook. They're saying, keep doing the work. In other words, they're trying to get past our surface level hand wringing or our bits and pieces of things just on social media. I mean, that's important and it's needed, but they're trying to get past that to say, you need to be looking at your shadow, all the bits of you that are hidden that you're not aware because one way or another, an evil system came up. Nobody said, hey, let's do that, but we all contributed one way or another. And we were all a little culpable from a shadow point of view. And we're going to have to bring things from the subconscious up. We're going to have to start to notice those things before we'll do anything about that system. Mm -hmm. And so the, the genius of keeping us provoked, keeping us uncomfortable, keeping us in the question, I think is about trying to get us to have a look at what sits in the shadow of all of us so that any prejudice, anything at all, and, and the core thing at the, 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 the core of the shadow is the protecting of privilege. You know, and we would say no, but actually we would fight like mad to try and keep our salary levels and our levels of comfort and the things that we enjoy. And it's like, what behaviour does that produce if we're trying to create a little bit more sharing and equity about that? Um, so I think that's been part of the genius has been the provoking element of it that doesn't let you off the hook that's requiring you to keep going deeper into how did this system arise and what part did you play in its maintenance? Yeah, and, and the people like I mentioned Rachel Cargill earlier is a beautiful orator, storyteller, provoker. Now she is mm -hmm. genius at holding that, genius, and is creating uncomfortableness and elegantly. Mm -hmm. Jane Elliot, Jane Elliot, is it Jane Elliot? Oh yeah, she's great. <laughs> she's just <laughs> unbelievable, but well, in fact, not unbelievable, just wonderful in terms of what she's creating, in terms of provoking in the conversation, and she just incredible because it's you know it's Vanessa saying there's real conversations happening now. Not all of them are comfortable, but there's real conversations, and those conversations are needed and needed in the boardroom. And what I, I I'm gonna I hope it's okay for me to say this in terms of your course, but I'm going to guess you're going to talk rackets. 
I am, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think rackets, because whenever I do a piece of teaching on shadow or those the subconscious, it's like, yeah, but if it's subconscious, how do you get access to it? And it is that, that that provokes you, reveals to you what you truly believe. You know, so that that informs you out there in the world, you're probably dealing with reality, but that that provokes you is, um, mm, all right, that provoked me, that got under the skin a little bit. So something's going on. And then you can get curious. Then you can ask the questions of it. And so I found that rackets is um, one of the most accessible ways of getting access to the shadow. Um, I, I was researching a little bit for it recently and, and I was l looking at a, a kind of almost a timeline of Mary Louise von Franz's interviews and right at the beginning she said basically you don't get access to the shadow unless you go for analysis and then towards the end it was almost like as she got older she was like as long as you're married or in any kind of relationship whatsoever you will get access to shadow just <laughs> you know it's going to come up she said so she kind of lightened in terms of life will reveal it but it's still hard and it's quite tough work and it requires leaps of faith into almost like a negative lens on yourself that's hard. But shadow, but, but rackets don't. Rackets, when we teach rackets, there's a humour about it because you could like, oh yeah, that's me. Oh, that's me as well. Yeah, I did that one. And, uh, and then you kind of look at it and then suddenly you're stuck with, what's the cost of that? Like, oh, yikes. And so then the disturbance happens far quicker and easier, but also with a lighter touch. And then there's a construct to it that allows you to kind of begin to investigate. What am I getting out of this? What is it costing? What's the vulnerability? And suddenly you can start to get an easier access to that racket place. Certainly for the business world, it's yeah. the most appropriate way in. And, and uh, most people love the racket. Everybody is in a much better mood after they've explored and identified one or two of the rackets. They're settled, they're in a better mood, they're much more open. I remember you said in your video that uh, rackets are like the invisible rudder of your life. And it feels like in the boardroom, in our organisations, they are the invisible rudder of the organisation. And if we can start to explore that through rackets, it's unbelievably powerful and so valuable to everyone in the organization if you can do it as you do with humor and, and say, oh, yeah i do that <laughs> often um and and for people to be faced with it and and i think that's just delightful but actually it just it does it's a trojan horse for having a great conversation it breaks down so many is. barriers so many and also but like at the organizational sense you've taught on this you know this idea of as you're moving through levels of consciousness you're ready for the next level of consciousness when your current level reveals its racket to you mm. you know like I, i've seen it so much in religious organizations so you've got that strong blue here's the right way this is the biblical interpretation this is how you should live your life this is what's right and wrong and that works phenomenal and it's, these are actually very loving organizations to be in i still operate very much in that world and um, they're very loving and you feel a great sense of belonging right up until the two big leaders disagree on what god says and then you get the shadow of the witch hunt and the being made wrong and all that stuff and when you've been exposed to that you're like oh yikes i'm ready to have a much more scientific broader other perspectives view of the world i'm ready now for something else it's when the shadow of that culture is revealed that you think i, I think now i could maybe start to think a little bit differently i even saw that in, in my sort of initial learnings into so through psychology and then nlp that there's so many of the founders of the of the human potential development that no longer speak to one another you know and I... it just seems to be i was like <laughs> i don't <laughs> an irony isn't that yeah should someone to send them and someone <laughs> talked about iron with them because I did uh, you know these phenomenal people that you know that I felt that had opened up my brain and my heart and to so many things and be like wow I hate each other's guts just, <laughs> just, just, <laughs> I, does nobody know that this is a psychology based on rapport <laughs> It's just like, oh. does anyone else get that I, this is weird right um but it's there and it's it's it is 
allowing ourselves to confront that and and Jim Jim Higginbotham who I just every time I say that name I just love it he's just got it's a powerful name right he's um, a super guy you'll enjoy him I I feel that I feel, he was asking um so he's going straight in there for breakfast uh, can you give an example <laughs> of how you've grown through embracing or releasing your own shadow yes um so I had this nurturing kind of desire. You know, I used to run all sorts of rackets against procurement departments. <laughs> I hear you. And um, who are p- people by demons, uh, obviously. And uh, whenever I would engage with a large organisation, I was David and they were Goliath and they would come with their 76-page contract reports. And oh, and, um, and so at some point, I would find my tension going up and up and up until I got the discharge through phoning them at some point and blasting somebody on the phone for the ridiculousness of this. And then when I would engineer them saying something that I could then complain about, um, I would escalate it. And and then I would use all my names because I was normally dealing with the board or the senior level at the organisation and do you, you know. And... Um, I did this about three times and realized that there's a pattern here. There's a pattern. So either all procurement departments are peopled by the demonic or it's um, something in me that I'm projecting onto this. What is it? And so the easiest answer came to me, first of all, which was my um, dyslexia, which is a 76 page report is going to get me up in arms and it's going to start to get me shame based and can I work with this and uh, those things that was the first bit um but the second bit was um I started to realize what was really going on that was much more embarrassing because the, the, the dyslexia is very mild it's very you know it's fine and I'm I'm I'm, I'm cool with it and actually I, I'm not even sure it exists um in me anymore it was a university thing um but the thing that does irk me that I don't like is what was really going on was my need for significance. Mm. You know, as some innocent frontline administrative person was getting blasted by the guy who was meant to be in the organization showing role modeling, great organizational behavior um, and human skill until he was upset, until something didn't you know suit him. And then all his skills were turned towards punishing. I was like, what is that? And uh, it was about significance. It was about being treated as if it was insignificant and therefore I would show them my significance and I would engineer conversations that would allow for that. I did not like that colour on me at all. Um, but as I began to integrate it, I've realised my appreciation of power means that I know how to work with it increasingly at very senior levels in government and in organisations. And that what started off as just somebody trying to get above themselves or be boastful or name droppy or all those things, I started to realize actually it's in me and it's in me in terms of its proper contribution is something that allows me to appreciate the paradoxes that very senior people have to hold, the power they can wield at the right moment and their psyche in terms of being a public name and a figure and how you work with that. And so that became increasingly my research over the last kind of 10 years which I'm intrinsically motivated to do because of something that was a disowned shadow before starting to become an integrated part of my appreciation of significance mm. I love that I'm still a little bit iffy about procurement but you know I, I, see, where, <laughs> I see where you're going um, so your course is in July yeah it is 21st it starts um, uh, it's getting lodged today we're actually yay! put putting the word out um, and uh, I've been sat researching and actually coming up with different kinds of rackets. Um, So not just like examples of rackets, but actually different types of rackets. You know, what's a volitional racket where you're at it, you know, you're going for the payoff versus what's an armory racket where you've just got some kind of real pain or vulnerability inside that you're, 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 you're working around. So I've, I've come up with six different ways of looking at rackets um, that I'm looking forward to sharing. Um, and I'm excited by it. I'm super excited. I think I'm super excited to, to be on it. And um, Jim relates to your your um, your chat, uh, for sure. So he gets it in terms of the racket. Um, uh-huh. 
you're just there's loads i think we're both in a space of learning a lot and researching mm-hmm. and we're just i'm loving the whole fact that we're learning so much just now and i think we can learn a lot from ourselves in terms of the shadow we can learn a lot from standing guard to our mind about what we're looking at outside but learn from what is happening as you say and i love you saying is that what provokes you you know that is is go with that you know if, if you want to do any shadow work even just go with that and journal with that and walk with that and see see what is coming up for you and yes. and go into that uncomfortableness and i think that's going to be going forward um we're gonna um to, well tomorrow night i think we're going to be <laughs> geniusly coaching each other um <laughs> live bye. live okay people um and so the podcast we've had so we've just launched another three we took a little bit of a break to work out what the next conversations were so we're in our second season I, we're confused uh, but <laughs> we're in our second season now and we've got three talking about overwhelm change and archetypes um yeah. there's delicious magic in the archetypes because we start talking about different ones and and how that resonates and what is needed perhaps if we need other archetypes going forward we talk about change and we do bring in the spiral again and i know that kind of um it it it, it sort of marmites the the listening because people are no again um Mm -hmm. and i think there's there there is we keep coming back to it because it's it's a, a great model of consciousness and and will allow people to look at change in a different way um yeah. but tomorrow we are going to coach each other on change yeah yeah that's going to be good looking forward to it shed a tear yeah uh, yeah i'm not let, <laughs> let's let's not put that out there into the world jim mcneish because you know i'll be first um <laughs> And I, I love what John was saying, John Haynes, the lovely John Haynes, who I've never met, but um, I know is lovely. So the power of humour to disarm rackets should not be underestimated, um, yeah. which is 100% true, 100% true. Um, I'm going to just check a couple of more questions um, before mm-hmm. we let you lovely people crack on, um, crack on with their day. Ah, oh, Steve McGregor, how you doing? Um, yeah, I think, well, Janet, we're making someone think first thing in the morning. So, you know, if we can make people think that I, that's kind of what our intention is, is, is to get people thinking. And I think that there's big opportunity, even we've spoken ourselves, you know, 13 weeks ago, nobody knew what Zoom was. And, and no. now we're just like, yeah, we'll Zoom, should we Zoom that? Um, when you get a phone call, it's just like, we can't see people, what is happening? Um, there is an amazing way that we can engage with people through this forum, you know, and I think that's the power of what we can do with with L&D and leadership. And, and even though we have been disconnected physically, it could be, and Vanessa's testimony to that in terms of the coaching conversations, it could be the most connecting time that we could have. Mm-hmm. You know, we've Absolutely. got we've got big opportunities. I guess I'm interested in can we create ritual? Mm-hmm. Could, could we create ritual? And and yeah, I'm really surprised that Apple haven't come up with their video conferencing thing yet. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm interested to see what their mm-hmm. what that next game would be if they're going to do something like that. Because I wonder if the next people who are able to bring in ritual. So we've got plenty of ceremony in our modern world. But ceremony only deals with the positive upside of the human condition, whereas ritual brings in the shadow. Ritual has a darker element. It has fire and nighttime and uh, scariness and uh, re-engaging with yourself. And I wonder what ritual looks like in going back to work. I wonder what ritual will look like. Uh, It's not just repeat. It's actually rites. It's things that convey you to a new level of consciousness or awareness. And so I'm intrigued by that in terms of what will be the new rituals that will be part of how we talk to one another and how we engage. Um, I wonder if we will get beyond the various issues and causes that are happening at us just now that are disturbing us into a place where we can just accept disturbance. Mm. We don't need something bad happening in the world um, or to notice um, or have it kind of 
made us to notice, you know, what would it be like if we just got used to the fact that there is real benefit in ritual, where on a, a, a regular basis we are doing the work on ourselves and we are looking beyond the obvious? I feel like a mic drop happened there with accept the disturbance. Like that's got like a, a slogan all over it. And I think to sit with that is is huge and to be comfortable with that and mm -hmm. and to help people in the conversations that we have going forward. Because as we integrate, as we come into, I was speaking last night to Scott and Scott, Billy's still hanging out the window with the aerial. So thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> uh, the We didn't have FOMO, you know, fear of missing out didn't, Ex didn't exist because there was no party. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, you know, different parts of the country are. Uh, I even I got I started shouting on my phone yesterday because like, again technology, but it came up and it said your local store is open, and I was like, no, it's not. I'm in Scotland, <laughs> it's not. And it was just like, all right, Kirsty, Cam. Um, <laughs> but it was just like, and, and that sort of element of the fear of missing out was kind of coming through and. And I'm wondering what that's going to do as we integrate teams. Some people are going to be in the office, some not. You know, schools, how do we work education and, you know, A teams and B teams and how do we make that work? And and I think it is about if we can accept the disturbance and, and have the right conversations and and have the foresight to know that we're going to have to put different rituals in place, especially from a mental health perspective. Absolutely. You know, we're going to need that, and we're going to, and as a community perspective, um, I remember being on an NLP program once, and it was Robert Diltz and um, Ian McDermott, and somebody asked them, "How do we? If you're trying to build a community here, how do you get the shadow dealt with in this community?" And neither of them were at their best. You know, they're really smart guys. I, I like both of them enormously, and they're they're both really smart, but. None, none of them had really thought about that. They'd kind of been in such an NLP mode of kind of you fix it, you know, you sort it. But it was this really wise old woman that had asked it. Mm. And um, she'd asked it in the group and then they didn't give much of an answer. And then somebody else asked a question. The person behind her said, would you mind not interrupting me? She turned and screamed at him. He screamed back at her. This hugely violent kind of, they didn't actually hit each other, but this violent interaction occurred. It was deeply disturbing in the room. And um, I remember thinking, oh, wow, that woman saw something and she elicited it. And, you know, Robert and Ian were shocked by it. You know, it was like, this, whoa, what was that? And it was the shadow made an appearance. Um, and, and I never think that many of those communities sustained themselves. And I think it was because they never had a container for the shadow side. And, and that's, um, I'm looking forward to seeing, do we get smarter at that as we go into the future? I'm super excited. I'm super grateful that you even had even more graciousness than I thought it was possible from you, that you did this again. Um, no, and the warm up was awesome. I kind of enjoyed this one too. Um, Matthew, just so you know, and thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, tomorrow's coaching session, uh, she gulps again, um, is going to be, you'll be able to access it on my LinkedIn events and you can go through Eventbrite, um, but I'll make sure I get like a little, I don't know why I'm, I'm talking to an iPad here, like, but Matthew, uh -huh. I will make sure I get information to you. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, I'm super excited because we have... Um, the next time that we are going to be talking, which should be <laughs> next Monday um, at eight o'clock, I've got Ruth Major, um, who's going to be here and the delightful and beautiful Ruth Major. So is clinical lead at a wonderful company um, called Lisburn Common. And I'm having more and more conversations as Jim is as well in terms of mental health and what does that mean? And the space that they hold for people and to equip leaders um, with, with having those conversations is wonderful. So you'll hear the beautiful, beautiful brogue of Ruth Major at eight o'clock on Monday morning. For that alone, you need to join in. Um, so people, thank you so much for tuning in. Have a beautiful Tuesday. Um, we appreciate your patience and your your tenacity for sticking with us. Jim McNeish, you are a legend. Um, and I will see you tomorrow night for a coaching. Assume crash position, people. Take care. <laughs>